All right, well, I welcome you back to getting to hear me talk for a second time in two days. Um, today I'll be talking about something near and dear to my heart, which is secondary ion mass spectrometry. So, um, okay, make sure everything works. Good. All right, so Rick was just talking about OJ and XPS, where we have a situation where we're looking at uh, photons or electrons coming in and measuring electrons coming out. With SIMS, it's much simpler than that. We are only dealing with ions. So we have primary ions that come in and secondary ions that come out. So it's an analytical technique based on that. And we talk about high energy ions in this case, which is very different than the high energy ions um, we were dealing with at RBS, where those were in the MEV region. These are only in the one to about 25 kilovolts. Um, key advantages of SIMS uh, is that um, we are measuring ions coming out and the mass of them. And so therefore, we can actually look at things like isotope differences, um, which you can't do with other techniques. Also, we're sensitive all the way down to hydrogen, which is not possible with many other techniques. So you can do hydrogen and lithium and such. And we have a huge dynamic range that allows us to really look at things with very low concentrations, well below 1%. So just uh, following up on that technique comparison. So here's OJ and XPS that Rick had talked about, you know, what we're measuring things. Um, spatial resolutions uh, can get much better with the OJ than you can with SIMS, where we're limited. Rule of thumb, one micron, you can do better. Um, as a matter of fact, um, a lot of the new ones are doing down um, under 100 nanometers uh, with that. Sampling depths, though, tend to be very good very close to the surface where you're measuring it. And where SIMS really shines is here in the uh, detection limits. You know, we can do parts per million, parts per billion in some cases. Uh, so that's really nice. Technique was really developed initially um, by the electronic, microelectronics industry wanting something that could measure their dopant levels. And so that's what really drove, the, drove it early on. A downside is, of course, it's very challenging to get quantitative results. Um, and we'll talk about that more later. But we can, we can get elemental data and also some molecular data uh, if it's only at the surface. And we can do decent work with insulators, although it, it is tricky. Generally, like I, what I like to say is if you're looking for 1% and above, OJ and XPS are good. Uh, some of the other techniques with the SEM usually start there. And then when you need to go to lower concentrations, come and work with the SIMS. This is a block diagram of the SIMS technique. Um, so of course, we start with a primary ion beam coming in. This can be cesium, oxygen, gallium, uh, gold. Bismuth is very popular now, and some other more exotic things um, that come in and strike your sample surface. And then we sputter away material. We had a nice talk earlier today about the technique of sputtering, so you kind of understand the billiard ball collision idea. Uh, you sputter away. and some fraction of that will be ionized. If it's ionized, we can weigh it because we can put a big electric field right in front of the sample through the energy analyzer and then um, take it through a mass spectrometer, which separates them based on mass. And then we hit a detector. So detectors tend to be electron multipliers or Faraday cups. You can also have things like resistive anode encoders that allow you to get like an image. So it's actually a microscope. Uh, or channel plates would do the same thing. Different types of results we can get are mass spectrum. So looking at the masses and the intensity of each mass, we can pick a peak and perform a depth profile or perform an image, or we can combine it all into an image depth profile. In SIMS, we tend to talk about two regimes that you're working in. Static SIMS or dynamic SIMS? Dynamic SIMS is the, the older of the two. Um, and that's where you're actually just constantly churning away and removing material. So if someone's going to say, is your SIMS uh, non-destructive? You ask them, how big of an area do you need to be non-destructive? Um, because we are going to make a crater, uh, especially if you're doing dynamic work. Um, and so we tend to define that as you know, a significant flux. Downside when you're doing all this churning for the sputtering is you tend to mix everything together. And so you, when you're doing depth profiling, you're really limited to elemental work, although 
there are now situations where they're getting past that, um, and we'll discuss that a little bit later. But this is key. Very, very high sensitivity. You know, parts per million type things. Um, static sims came about later, and is really neat because um, the, the concept is, if we only affect 1% of the surface, is it really destructive? You know, 99% of it's still OK. And so that's how we define it. So we say, you know, if um, silicon has 10 to the 15 atoms per square centimeter on the surface, and we affect less than 10 to the 13 in the experiment, then we'll say it's, it's effectively the same. You can come back to the same area and get the same result. And when that happens, it allows us to see some molecular things. And so we get 2D surface images. Um, and so of the uh, instrumentation we have, we have one that does a very good job for doing dynamic work and one that does a very good job for dynamic or uh, static work. The uh, Kamika IMS 5F that we have is very good for doing dynamic sims. Um, so we send a continuous beam in. It'll either be cesium or oxygen to hit the sample surface. And then we um, pull out the secondary ions and we bend them through an electrostatic analyzer, an electromagnetic, electromagnetic analyzer, and through a final slit before they hit one of our detectors. So therefore, you're only measuring one mass at a time. You can quickly switch between them, but only one mass at a time. Um, so it's very useful to know what you want to look for before you put your sample in. Finally, when we get to the detectors, we have a couple options. Um, we can bend it over here to the electron multiplier um, for like 0 to 10 to the 5th counts per second. If we're going 10 to the 6th or better, you use the Faraday cup. And you try to avoid 10 to the 5th to 10 to the 6th. <laughs> We can also do some imaging. This, like I said, this, is, this can be used as a microscope, an ion microscope. Although, to be honest, the uh, newer instrument next door, the TOF SIMS, does that a whole lot easier. How is the TOF SIMS different? So instead of, and here we'll use a, uh, a gold gun for our analysis, but we still have a cesium and oxygen second, a second gun that we use for depth profiling. So the way it's different is, we're going to measure how long it takes for the ions to get to the detector. So therefore, you can't have a continuous beam anymore. So we spend a lot of effort in the top sims making a uh, ion beam that comes and hits the surface in a pulse with a very, very short pulse length. So therefore, we generate all of our secondary ions here at the surface at time equals zero. We still accelerate them away in, a, in an electric field, and then um, so we've given them a certain amount of kinetic energy, which we all know is one half mass times velocity squared. So if you put a detector far enough away, all the light ones will arrive first, the heavy ones will arrive later. So you get a complete spectra for each pulse that you send in. Um, in order to not have such a big room and get other advantages, we actually bend it through some electrostatic plates before it hits the detector. Um, so that's one of the advantages there. Um, in this case, the detector is a channel plate, so it gives us both the position and the, the counts. Ion beam sputtering is a very complicated uh, thing. So we have the ion beams, the primary ions coming down in, hitting the surface. You can see down here we have a lot of uh, the 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 white, the red circles stand for atoms in the, in the material. The blue ones, of course, are our sputter beam. You can see we've got sputter beam coming down in and mixing all around. Our um, sample is getting all mixed up as well. Um, we have some dopants here. And then what do we get out? Well, we get out all kinds of things, positive and negative, neutral species, mostly neutral species. Um, we have some beam, a beam getting re-sputtered back. Um, and the crater tends to have amorphous material and lots of bond breaking. Um, so there's lots of things that are going on. We can get photons out. We can get electrons out, lots of things. So this is where I usually show a nice molecular dynamic simulation of an ion impact done by uh, Professor Garrison at Penn State. She was looking at um, sending in a single gallium ion and the damage that's done on the surface and then comparing it to a molecular, a C60 molecule. Um, because as I was saying, 
doing depth profiling, you tend to lose the molecular information. From her work here, they decided to start using larger and larger molecules to allow you to do molecular depth profiling. And so if I can get this to work right. So this will be a gallium atom coming in. You'll see it hit the surface. You'll see one atom that sputters away. And just look at the size of the damaged area that comes in. So the yellow atoms are gallium atom. Here's our surface. You can see the various surface layers. Uh, I'm going to zoom in and boom. Saw the one atom come flying off. And then this is the level of damage that you're doing. All the mixing is coming just from one gallium atom hitting. And then this is the top view of it. Now, um, for the C60, here it is with the, the buckyball. Same, same thing hitting the surface. But now, look at how much stuff comes out. And you're going to have molecules coming out in addition to atoms. And the damage layer is much, much smaller than what we were seeing originally. talk about how to do quantitative work with SIMS. It's very difficult. Um, we have this nice big equation here uh, talking about the secondary ion current is related to the primary ion current. The sputter yield, how many atoms come out based on what you put in. This factor called the ionization probability. And then information on what is the actual concentration that you're trying to get out. And the system situation. The difficulty we have is in this alpha term because it varies orders of magnitude. Like it can vary by the order of four orders of magnitude. Um, and so it, and it doesn't vary in nice ways. You know, there's lots of things that can be, that can change it. Um, you can have matrix effects. You can have different surface coverages affected. Uh, background pressures, crystallographic orientation, angle of emission. So basically what it comes down to is SIMS, you cannot, by first principles, get a value for quantitative. But on the flip side, if we use a standard sample, we have all these advantages. We can measure very low concentrations. We can be, get good results. So instead of looking at all these things as being a, a negative, let's try to use them to our advantage. Let's use surface coverage of reactive elements to enhance our sensitivity so we get more counts so we can measure lower concentrations. And so that's what we tend to do with SIMS. So if you're up here in this part of the periodic table, you're generally with electronegative elements. Um, and so if we want to enhance our signal there, we'll use a cesium sputtering gun. And that basically you can think of as the cesium has this extra little electron sitting out on the end, right? And it wants to give it away. It's not exactly how it works, but it's a good way to remember it. Um, and so it's very easy to make negative ions here. Over here, we have a situation where we have electropositive things. And so we'll use an oxygen sputtering gun. And you can kind of think of it, you sputter away a metal plus oxygen, and then the oxygen breaks off, but it takes an extra electron. So now you have a positive ion. And so those are easier to measure with positive ions. You can actually see this graphically here where you're seeing, you know, uh, the, the one on the left here is looking at um, M minus, metal minus, and so sulfur, oxygen, very easy to measure, but calcium's not so good, zinc's not so good. Over here with positive ions, calcium's good, magnesium's good, but um, the sulfur's not very good. You'll notice zinc tends to be bad in both cases, um, so therefore we tend to um, have to think of another solution for that. And so that, they actually found out things for like zinc and cadmium um, you can look at by using metal plus cesium positive ion. Um, and so there are ways around it in those special cases. And those are important for a lot of gallium arsenide work because those are dopants in that. 
How do we be quantitative then? We tend to use ion implants to get us a what's known as a, a RSF, relativity, relative sensitivity factor. Um, you can define it this way if you're talking about a level profile or if you're talking about a Gaussian profile. But basically, it's just a way to ratio the counts that you're getting from the matrix and the element of interest, the dopant, uh, to the actual dopant concentration. So this is a, a, an example of uh, uh, ion implanted phosphorus sample. I'm going to use it. This would be what I would use to determine an RSF, but then I can also use the RSF to make concentration values. Uh, I ran this twice. I ran this in the good condition, where you would be using the um, uh, cesium beam to do the measurement. And I also ran it in the bad measurement condition, where you'd use the oxygen beam. Nice thing about phosphorus, it's group 5, so therefore it's pretty close. You can do it both ways. Um, and so we have silicon signal up here. The vertical axis is the counts per second. And the horizontal axis is our depth. Um, generally, this is in time. Then you can use a stylus profilometer or optical profilometer to figure out how deep your crater is after the fact to get your sputtering rate. Um, and so we get two things of signal. But then when you do the calibration, apply the calibration, you can get, they, they follow on. And you can see we're down here in the 10 to the uh, 18 uh, atoms per cubic centimeter. You'll see by doing it in the bad configuration, you have noisier data, but you can still get good results. One more definition that I want to throw out here real quick, uh, mass resolution. So with like uh, Rick spectrometers and with the uh, Kamika sims, where you're bending things through an electromagnet, the thing that's constant across the various uh, masses in my case is the um, for resolution is m over delta m. Uh, so that's the thing that's constant. So that's the way we defined mass resolution in the sims. And so um, you look at your peak, you see the full width half maximum, and so you take the mass divided by that full width half maximum that gives you your your mass resolution, and that stays as a constant in the in the magnetic sector sims. And so, for instance, you know, you're on the, oops, one. Yeah, here's your full half max, full width half maximum. Um, with the top sims, of course, you're not using a, a magnetic sector, so therefore you don't have that. So when you're defining your mass resolution on a top sims, you gotta also tell what mass you're using. Uh, so that's just an important thing to know. I'll also point out that we do a lot of plots that are on a log scale, because as you can see, the sulfur and the O2 here, um, you would not be able to see the O2 very easily on a linear scale. All right, that's it for definitions. <laughs> so some examples. Um, this was a depth profile done of a, um, a gallium arsenide sample that was alternately doped with silicon and with carbon um, and was annealed in nitrogen. And what this shows us is we do have the ability to, to follow the um, dopant levels. This is the carbon dopant level. This is the silicon dopant level. And also, we can follow the hydrogen. And so you can see as the, you're annealing it, you're actually losing hydrogen to the surface. Uh, and so that may have an effect on the, the properties of the, of the uh, device that's being done. The other thing I'd like to sh point out here is that we have a very large dynamic range. So one, two, three, four, five, six orders of magnitude on this plot alone. And we can see hydrogen. This is an example doing some isotopic analysis. Basically, uh, we combined uh, OJ results, OJ depth profile with the SIMS depth profile where the OJ were following the various elements and in the SIMS we're specifically looking at the uh, two isotopes of oxygen, and by knowing which one diffuses, you can tell whether it's the metal that's diffusing or the oxygen that's diffusing. In this case, I think we had um, Ni3 aluminum sample that was being oxidized, and we found out that, uh, if I remember correctly, the nickel and the oxygen both diffuse, but the aluminum does not. Uh, example of a sample where I was more involved, um, we're looking at some gas source MBE of uh, 
ultra highly blonde dope layers. Uh, things that jump out at me on this, of course, is we have these nice flat tops. So in the process, they were changing the boron doping rate. So they'd turn it on a certain gas flux and then turn it off, and then turn on higher gas flux and turn it off. And so we have nice flat layers. So that means our doping is very good, uh, very good. Here we're starting to see a little bit of a tail. So after you turn it off, there's still some boron on the surface that needs to be worked in. And that tends to get worse as you get higher and higher. But we were able to get up to some very high um, boron doping concentrations, uh, 3 times 10 to the 20th. SIMS is also very good at measuring, uh, not greatest plot, I apologize, but um, measuring very thin layers. And so these are some delta doped boron layers as well. And so um, it shows the, how good of a depth resolution you can get with it, um, which can be on the order of nanometers. <coughs> More recent example of some stuff we were doing, uh, work with some people over at, um, um, at MNTL. They wanted a non-lithographic way to pattern wafer scale nanostructures, um, but etching of highly doped arrays caused lots of pores and such. So the idea was to make the arrays lightly doped, lightly dope the surface, make the arrays, and then dope them with the spin on dopant afterwards. We had done some previous results that showed that um, this works, um, and they could make the the the, um, the tips down here look very nice. Um, so then the, the question then became, can we do? They wanted to make contacts to here to the tops, and so we did some more. And this shows some Sims results where the dashed line is where the the tips ended. And so you can see we have enhanced doping up near the top um, of, the, of the array. This was some work that we did with lithium ion batteries. So lithium ion batteries consist of a graphite negative electrode and a lithium containing positive electrode, um, usually with nickel, cobalt, or manganese, and then uh, an electrolyte. Uh, a lot of cases it's uh, lithium phosphorus F LiPF6. One problem that they, we see is there's an impedance rise at the negative electrode. And so the uh, SIMS results that we did early on showed that um, we see a large rise of manganese and cobalt that diffuses from the, um, from the electrode uh, across, thereby poisoning the other electrode. Um, so we did some additional experiments where we put down an alumina coating on the uh, positive electrode and then found that this caused, an, it, it inhibited the transition of the metals going across. Um, eventually though, if you aged it enough, you would see the aluminum going and the manganese going, but uh, it helped uh, increase lifetime significantly. So all these results that I was showing there was done on our Kamika sims. Um, and that generally was done in the dynamic mode. Find the cursor. In dynamic sims. So we had material removal, elemental analysis, and depth profiling. We can also do static sims using the TOF sims. And this gives us ultra surface analysis, uh, elemental and molecular. And then the analysis can, is complete before a significant fraction of the molecules are destroyed. So the, Sims, the top SIMS is highly capable in that regime. One of the other things that's nice about it is we're just how high a mass you want to go is how long you wait in between each pulse. So in theory, you could go to very high masses. This is showing uh, a gold-coated sample where we're seeing um, clusters coming off up to 50 gold molecules in size. Generally, you don't get that good. It, the signal tends to drop off about 1,000 AMU. But with the top sims, we still have very good mass resolution. You know, you can, even though two things are at the same nominal mass, like uh, the gallium hydroxide and the gallium NH3, um, our mass resolution is quite high being able to show us these things. You can see uh, the shoulder here on these, again, all at the same nominal mass. We also have good lateral resolution. Uh, these are showing some uh, indium arsenide 
quantum dots on gallium arsenide and so some indium line scans and you can see you know, half a micron about the size of the, these quantum dots. You can have very good depth profiling resolution. This is a indium, uh, gallium, aluminum gallium arsenide uh, multi-layer stack uh, and it shows approximately one period for every two nanometers in depth. This was an uh, interesting, going back to some experiments then, this is an interesting experiment done um, with Professor Seabauer's group where they're looking at the fact that you have a bending of the Fermi level near, sur near surfaces. Um, and so we're taking advantage of the low energy, two kilovolt gallium or, or oxygen gun in the uh, top sims to do depth profiling. Uh, the experiments explore the interaction of a charged point defects near the surface region on the bulk diffusion in a biased sample. So they bias their sample during uh, oxidation processes or boron processes. Uh, and so they can actually look at um, how things are moving in the field uh, at the surface. And so they were able to make an analytical model and it, uh, some of the results there showed that the drift opposite to diffusion causes a pile up of, of uh, oxygen near the surface. Um, but if the drift in the diffusion direction would deplete the surface, near surface of mobile defects. Um, and so the vacancies can also be an important thing in this process as well and those vacancies can tend to be charged. One downside to doing depth profiling in the tough sims is you have to use two guns. And so therefore, um, alignment of the two guns become very important. Um, ideally, we think of doing sputtering and we want, we're thinking we're going to have a square bottom crater, right? So that when we do our measurement here, all of our measurement is at the same depth when we do our work, right? But the reality is in uh, sims, you tend to have something that's a little more curved. But that's okay because if we do our measurement here just in the middle, we'll be okay because it's again at the same depth. And you can get a nice uh, result like this. Um, this is some neodymium in uranium oxide uh, that they did. The problem was, of course, whenever you're dealing with uranium, right? It's, it's hard, hard to have a lot of stuff, right? So his samples were really, really tiny. So he was trying to do his alignment on one sample and then do his measurement on another sample. And so in that case, you could end up where you're actually doing your depth profile over here on the side. And so therefore, you've now spread out all of your depth information. You've convoluted it. And so his profiles tended to look a lot worse. So they started later, and then they looked a lot different. Takeaway here is you have to have samples that are big enough to do a couple spots on each one. Um, generally, if you're half centimeter by half centimeter, I can work with that. Generally, I like one centimeter by one centimeter. This was a neat project we did um, with Josh Ritchie. Uh, so he has this molecule that um, breaks under light. And so the idea was, can we see it? Uh, and it, so what he ended up doing was he brought me a molecule that was completely covered with fluorines. And I said, ah, can see it very easily. He goes, of course, that's not a very useful one to me. So then he came back with this one. And he said, what if I put a bromine on it? And I said, I don't know. Let's try. And so we did. And what it turns out is a little hard to see right at the beginning. But uh, you can actually pick up where he patterned it and broke the molecules. Um, you see no br bromine. That's here. And in the areas where he, the molecules are still left, you do see the bromine. Uh, what's interesting is you can actually see the effect of the sulfur, which is, exists in both, but is more screened when the bromine is in existence. Uh, and then this also shows the type of lateral resolution we can get. So this is a 50 micron scale. Uh, we can also do uh, biological samples. This was some work done by Eric Monroe looking at single cell imaging in the tough sims. Uh, mass spectrum gives you peaks, but then, of course, the difficulty is figuring out what the peaks mean. Uh, so he used the advantage of able to do imaging to help him figure that out. Um, so 
what he found was if he's looking at a peak like the vitamin E peak here and he had a fragment, he, another mass had a fragment, but the image looked the same, he could determine that those were related. And so the, um, this, this mass and the choline mass were about the, had the same image, so they were also related. And so what happens is you tend to sputter away things, but they tend to fragment. The, the molecules tend to fragment, so you actually get a certain pattern. Um, one of the new sims, the new top sims that are coming out, they just announced it last year. They actually put a second mass spectrometer, so you can actually send a mass spec in, break that apart, and look at its constituents for the, the peak, and that helps you identify things. So mass spec, mass spec is something that goes on a lot in the chemistry community. Another uh, sample that was done, this one by Kenzie Amaya, was looking at tough sims of the images of songbird brain. So we have a large sample holder that can be used. And this is actually a tissue slice cut from the entire brain of the songbird. Um, and so he did a very large imaging and then stitched them together. So this actually consists of 194 600 by 600 micron scans. Um, what they were trying to do is they know that if you put a new bird, a new chick, in an environment where it doesn't get to hear an adult sing, it'll never learn to sing. And so they wanted, what they wanted to see was what were the changes in the brain. And so they found out that there are certain fatty acids that if they're not in the right spot in the brain, the bird doesn't sing. And so they were able then to determine that for development, the fatty acids were necessary. Good time here to throw in a little uh, advertisement for the biological conference that will be coming up this fall. So just to let you know that uh, that will be coming up. And so uh, TOF Sims is used for biological work as well. Another thing that we're used for is uh, friction testing. So uh, a group from Argonne would come, comes down and does pin on disc testing. And so they look at the effects of different lubricants. And so um, this is a situation where they had diamond-like carbon coating on their ball, and they would wear it until it failed and take a look at what happened. Uh, and then from here, you can see that there's oxygen that's forming at the edge of the wear track, whereas there's oxygen at the edge of the wear track, uh, where there's carbon pretty much everywhere. You can actually do an overlay plot to see the two of them. Uh, and so when, the, when you get to the fa failure, it's probably due to oxygen coming in and affecting the diamond-like carbon coating. Can also, from the top sims, make 3D uh, models of the surface. In the software, you can actually rotate these around and look at them in different ways. Uh, and again, you, you can see the wear track here, where the oxygen is outside the wear track. And you can make movies, uh, same type of work. Uh, so this is a movie as you go into the sample. Uh, so you start at the surface, you have a lot of hydrogen, and as you go through, you start losing it. Um, so just uh, to, to finish up here with a summary of the top sims. So we're using uh, ions in, about 1 to 20 kilovolts of elect kilo electron volts of ions coming in, and we, can me we measure the masses coming out. Uh, can be up to you know, 10,000 AMU in specialized circumstances. Type of information we can get are surface mass spectra, uh, 2D surface ion images. We can do uh, elemental depth profiling and 3D image depth profiling. We can detect all the way down to hydrogen and up. Uh, and our sensitivity can be from parts per billion up to atomic percent. Uh, sampling depth tends to be about the order of a micron to several millimeters. Um, uh, sampling depth tends to be in the nanometer type range. So thanks to our sponsors, and I'm willing to take some questions. The matrix will have a role in the sensitivity of the The matrix has a, a huge role in the sensitivity of the sims. It can affect it by orders of magnitude. I actually had a situation where I was measuring a copper film on silicon and looking at the diffusion of the copper into the silicon. And so I'm following the copper in the copper film. And all of a sudden, when the silicon comes up, the copper comes up. So there wasn't more copper in the silicon than it was in the pure material. It's just the situation of the matrix effects 
makes it so much more easy to see the copper in the silicon than it does in the bulk. So the sample preparation will be almost similar to the Maldi. Yes, there's a lot of similarities between Maldi and Sims. Sample preparation. Yes. Okay, we have some questions from Oklahoma as well. Uh, is it possible to apply Sims technique to liquid samples? If so, does this involve any special sample preparation? Uh, I, I would say the same things that Rick said with respect to liquid samples. We have to put the material in a vacuum system, so it makes it very difficult. Although we do have a slight difference. There are techniques out there, DESI being one of them, where you're doing atmospheric mass spectrometry. Uh, and so there, you can actually have a little device which shoots ions or, or finds a way to ionize your, your liquid and then use a vacuum to pull those ions in and then do mass spectrometry on them. So those are newer techniques that exist. Can an MR, sorry, can an MR, uh, I mean multiple reaction monitoring can be better with, uh, with this type of technique? Multiple reactions? Yeah, with, uh, that comes with the ESI. Oh, um, can you repeat that question? Yeah, so basically, I think what you're asking is can you do multiple reaction monitoring? And if that's kind of like mass spec, mass spec, um, yes, that is, as a matter of fact, they, the companies just started producing that. There's two major manufacturers of time of flight sims, uh, and they both came out with their competing mechanism for doing that uh, this past year. Uh, also need ultra, high ultra high vacuum works wonders for doing this technique because it's so sur surface sensitive. I will tell everyone when they bring their sample to me that I will see things like sodium and potassium and fluorine and chlorine on their sample. And they said, but I didn't have any of that in my process. I'm like, did you carry it over to me in air? Yes. Then I will see these things. So it is very, very sensitive and that's the purpose of ultra high vacuum to get you a, a consistent surface for doing your, your probe your work.